we uh, has the team arrived and are we uh, ready to uh, get started? We are ready to roll when you are Supervisor Faust, yes. Excellent. Thank you and welcome everyone to the June 1 uh, meeting of the Economic uh, Advisory Commission, Fairfax County. Uh, before we get started, uh, we have to go through some procedural steps uh, because this is uh, a electronic uh, virtual meeting. So uh, to conduct this meeting fully electronically, the Economic Advisory Commission needs to make certain findings for the record to evidence our compliance with all applicable law. As a preliminary matter, FOIA requires us to ascertain the general location of each member participating remotely. So I would ask that each EAC member note your general location in the chat box or send that information to Vance Zavella at vance.zavella, Z-A-V-E-L-A, at fairfaxcounty.gov. You can include, you can describe it as your magisterial district or your general region like Oakton, Reston, Lorton, but it is a legal requirement. And uh, so we really encourage everybody to uh, do that. And uh, if not, uh, uh, poor Vance will be tracking you down. So in addition, uh, if you cannot adequately hear another member, please also so note that um, in the uh, chat box so that the issue can be addressed. So I'm going to, uh, is Supervisor Stork on the line? No. Yes, sir, I am. And, uh, Aha, there he is. Mr. Good morning, Supervisor Stork. Good morning. I'm going to pass you the virtual uh, gavel, uh, and I am going to make the following motion. I move that the Economic Advisory Commission certify that the state of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for this commission and the public to physically attend this meeting in person. And the usual procedures cannot be implemented safely or practically as a result. I further move that the Economic Advisory Commission conduct this meeting electronically through a dedicated video and audio, audio conferencing line and the public may access this meeting by calling 602-333-00 Three two, and entering access code one six seven three five two. So moved. I'll go ahead and second that. And uh, any discussion? Hearing none. Uh, all those in favor, please uh, either say aye or raise your hand in your box. Either one will will take. Aye. 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 Okay. All those opposed. All those opposed? Uh, any abstentions? The motion carries. Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Uh, finally, uh, I, I move that the Economic Advisory Commission certify that the matters on its agenda today relate to the COVID-19 emergency itself, are necessary for continuity in Fairfax County government, and or are statutorily required or necessary to continue operations and the discharge of the commission's lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. So moved. And uh, I'll go ahead and second that. Again, any discussion? If not, then all those in favor signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstentions. Motion carried. Thank you very much, Supervisor Stork. And I will uh, take the gavel back and ask uh, Teresa Benacasa for uh, to explain how we can part, uh, how uh, members can participate in this virtual meeting today. Thank you, Supervisor Faust. Um, all of us are familiar with Zoom. We're just going to run through uh, the meeting uh, etiquette today. If you would please keep your mic muted unless you are speaking. Um, if we rely on the raise hand icon, if you have a question during the course of the meeting. 
Um, as we mentioned before, if you could just rename yourself and, and ensure your full name is accurately listed, we'd appreciate that. As well as just please note, this is a public meeting and it will be recorded. And lastly, as uh, Supervisor Faust mentioned, we just need you to indicate your name and your location in the chat or reach out to Vance directly. Thank you, Supervisor Faust. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I guess an announcement uh, or more, more, uh, more a welcome. Uh, we have several new members who have joined the uh, Economic Advisory Commission since our last meeting. And uh, we want to welcome them. We're all looking forward to getting together at some point so we can go around the table and make sure everybody knows who everybody is. But for now, let me welcome uh, a good friend, the Honorable Pradeep Dekal from Herndon Town Council. Welcome, Pradeep. Sheila Dixon uh, with the Northern Virginia Black Chamber of Commerce. Michael Hewitt with Metropolitan Washington Airport Authority. The Honorable Steve Potter with the Vienna Town Council, Frank Woodruff, uh, who is the lead district representative, Ed Zapton, National Association of Industrial and Office Properties, and Christina Francis, uh, an at-large member uh, who uh, is with Jobs for the Future Lab. So uh, welcome to all of you. And if I missed anyone, I apologize, but we will get an opportunity soon, I hope to get together and introduce ourselves to each other. Uh, you've had, you have a copy of the minutes uh, that were forwarded to you. Does anybody have any changes uh, they would like to see made to the minutes? Hearing none, we will allow those minutes then to stand as the uh, record of our last meeting. Uh, I did want to mention uh, some sad news. There were two, uh, really uh, foundational members of the Economic Advisory Commission before I uh, became chair uh, 13 years ago, uh, believe it or not. Uh, when uh, McC uh, Supervisor McConnell was the chair of the Economic Advisory Commission, Michael Horwat and James Todd, uh, they were both giants uh, in the uh, economic development world in Fairfax County, both former members of the Economic Development Authority and the Economic Advisory Commission of Fairfax County, and both recently deceased. So really miss, uh, miss both of them and uh, thoughts and prayers uh, to their family. Uh, so let's give a, a couple updates. There's so much happening. Uh, we could spend the whole meeting on updates. We're not going to. Uh, everybody knows that we had that uh, uh, tremendously successful uh, uh, grant program uh, that we used $52 million from our CARES funding to help small businesses make it through the, uh, the, the initial uh, impact of the COVID virus. Uh, we are now, and we use the word uh, pivot, uh, we are pivoting uh, and we are also uh, using that term to describe a new grant program pivot grants that the board will consider uh, at the next board meeting. Uh, we've already had quite a bit of discussion about it and given a lot of direction to staff. They're gonna come back to the board uh, next week with a proposal for us to consider uh, that would create a new grant program that will be targeted uh, very specifically on industries where uh, the greatest impact of the uh, COVID virus was felt. We had tremendous consultants uh, working with the Economic Development Authority and our staff uh, identify the industries that we need to look uh, focus on. And mostly we're talking about restaurant, retail, uh, arts foundations, um, and uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm forgetting one, restaurant, retail. Anyway, uh, hospitality, hotels, of course, uh, of course. Artist here. So we're going to focus a grant program on that, those industries. And we're also, uh, the staff is proposing that we develop uh, programs that will help lift up in the entire industries rather than specific uh, grants, which we will do to individual uh, companies, but focusing on lifting the entire uh, industry as best as we can uh, with 
some resources. And this money pretty much is coming from the, uh, if, if the board agrees, uh, it's proposed that it come from the American Rescue Plan that we're about to uh, receive. So uh, one other update, uh, and this is, uh, you know, uh, Chairman McKay is uh, taking the lead on uh, uh, the, the issue of making our uh, uh, regulations more uh, accommodating to uh, businesses like restaurants uh, that want to uh, uh, create outside dining uh, and so forth. So all the things that we needed to do to make our regulations fit with the requirements that uh, were being imposed on businesses uh, because of the COVID virus. Uh, so we did that through phase, uh, through the initial phase of COVID based on uh, some uh, uh, board matter that uh, he uh, proposed and we all un unanimously uh, supported. Uh, he's now looking at uh, the next phase of this. First of all, uh, we were able to get a, a extension of those emergency regs that allow us to, to kind of uh, make our zoning ordinance more accommodating. So it was for six months after the emergency was no longer declared. Now it's for a full year uh, via Fairfax initiated legislation, but uh, he also uh, is asking staff to come together and figure out what we as a county can do to help businesses who have been uh, impacted and need to change the way they do business. Uh, and you know, maybe our regulations are not all that uh, accommodating at this time. So we need to work with uh, businesses. So. Uh, I, and those, those, those have been passed and uh, are in place unanimously supported by the board. Uh, so if you have issues as a business and please spread the word, we're trying to be as accommodating uh, and cooperative as we possibly can to uh, ensure that we, um, you know, our regulations work given the, the, the new, uh, new way a lot of people have to do business. We got that. And uh, the, the final thing that I have is uh, I have the, uh, the uh, I've been asked to uh, uh, discuss very briefly the one Fairfax policy, not so much as content, but to ensure that uh, uh, you're all uh, uh, familiar with it. And uh, uh, I'll say in 2017, the Board of Supervisors, along with Fairfax County School Board, adopted one Fairfax racial and social equity policy. The one Fairfax policy is a commitment to promote fairness and justice in the formation of public policy. So uh, all members of Fairfax County boards, authorities, and commissions, including the Economic Advisory Commission members, are encouraged to read and become familiar with the one Fairfax policy. You have been asked to complete an acknowledgement form indicating that you are aware of and understand the policy. Uh, EAC members should have received instructions on how to complete and submit the One Fairfax Policy Acknowledgement Form from our staff coordinator, Vance Savella. If you did not receive the message on May 6th, please contact Vance at vance.savella at fairfaxcounty.gov. Vance will make sure that you get the information and lead you through the process. Uh, the deadline for submitting uh, for all submissions is June 30th. So if you would uh, uh, be so kind as to uh, review the, uh, the, uh, that, the directions and acknowledge the plan, uh, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. We wanna make sure everybody in Fairfax County is focused on, the, uh, uh, on this one Fairfax uh, policy. If not, it's not going to work. It's going to take everybody pulling together. So with that, I am, I should ask, does anybody have any questions about anything we just covered? Kind of procedural and administrative and I apologize, but uh, had to do it. Okay. Hearing and seeing none. Uh, we can move to our first uh, substantive presentation. I, I mentioned that uh, 
you know, our consultants have demonstrated beyond any question that the impact on the hospitality industry, in particular hotels and restaurants, uh, uh, and on retail and arts and uh, organizations, has just been disproportionate uh, and, and very, very dramatic uh, in terms of how, how they were impacted. And we are very fortunate to have uh, a member of the uh, hospitality industry uh, speak to us today, uh, Gary Cohen. He's the executive vice president, uh, Glory Days Grill, since 2006. And uh, he's chairman of the Virginia Restaurant Lodging and Travel Association, vice chairman of Visit Fairfax, and the immediate past chairman of Washington Regional uh, Alcohol Program, RAP. Uh, can't think of anybody who probably has their finger more on the pulse of what's happening in that industry than Gary. So uh, we thank you so much, uh, Gary, for your time, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, good morning. Super, thank you, Supervisor Fast. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, somehow I blinked and I became an expert in our industry. I, I don't know how that happened. I have lived in Fairfax now for 42 years, uh, native of New York, and I moved down here and never left. So uh, I've been in this business a long time, worked for different companies. And um, yes, somehow I, I got to be the guy that's the chairman of the hospitality Association of Virginia during a pandemic. I don't know how I drew that short straw, but um, the reality is it, it's my perspective um, is really what I want to share because my perspective is, you know, my day job is I run Glory Days. Uh, and hopefully most of you, if you live in Fairfax, are familiar with Glory Days. We have 21 company stores, and but we have 39 if you include the franchises. And the reason I mention that is because my perspective gets broadened by franchising because we also have restaurants in Maryland, in North Carolina, in Georgia, and in Florida. And, uh, you know, I've been telling the same story over and over again. Florida, it's almost like the pandemic didn't happen in Florida. You know, that, that's like a different world, a different planet. Um, I'm saying that a little tongue in cheek, but, you know, they've had very small dips in sales and very little in restrictions. And so you can see, you know, I see the numbers every day and, uh, you know, I see how far down our restaurants went in sales and how, how, uh, up their restaurants are in sales. So, but uh, my position as chair of VRLTA, again, um, for those of you not familiar with that association, it represents all hotels, restaurants, and uh, travel related industry in Virginia. So my, my uh, horizons got broadened because uh, I've, I've learned through them uh, of what the uh, pandemic impact has had on the hotel industry and on the tourism industry. And, as bad as I think we had it, um, because I can tell my tale of woe, I, I'll spare you all, um, you know, of what the impact was on the average person's restaurant. Um, in some respects, I think hotels were hurt worse because, you know, we were at least able to pivot and go to, to go. Um, remember, I, I just want to make one point because I, I think it's always important to clarify. The restaurant industry is really divided into three categories, um, fast food, uh, fast casual. Fast casual is defined as um, like Panera and, and Chipotle, you know, counter service. Those two segments of the business were really, um, honestly, didn't do bad. Uh, fast food is reported to be 120% up uh, in 2020 over 2019. And fast casual is somewhere around 95% of, of uh, 2020 versus 2019, where full service restaurants really bore the brunt of the problem. Uh, because the government shut down our dining rooms, they shut down our bars, they, you couldn't come inside. Uh, those, so we really felt uh, the brunt of that. But hotels, you know, w went down really, really low and, and still today uh, remain in some cases at, at, at you know, only 40% occupancy or 50% occupancy. Uh, why? Because the business travelers haven't really started traveling. Um, the family travelers are starting to travel and, and clearly the resorts are starting to pick up. We all know how hard it is to get a rental at a beach this summer. Um, but the reality is business hasn't started happening and the urban hotels are really suffering. And then the tourism section. I mean, Kings Dominion didn't open last year. They have like 15,000 part-time employees and they never opened. Um, so as bad as I think uh, I have it, sometimes I'm, I guess I'm 
glad that I'm in the restaurant business and not the King's Dominion business. But, you know, we're all reopening uh, slowly. I just wanted to, I don't want to bore you with statistics because I, I know that you're all very smart people. I know you know the impact on the industry. Just bear with me for two minutes here. I'm just going to give you a summary that VRLA, VRLTA put together on the impacts in tourism uh, in the state of Virginia. So in 2019, domestic travelers spent $27 billion on transportation, lodging, food, amusement, recreation, and shopping in Virginia, a 3.4 increase uh, over 2018. The travel industry is the fifth largest private employer in Virginia. Pre-pandemic domestic travel expenditures directly supported 237,000 jobs in Virginia and directly generated $1.8 billion in tax revenue to state and local governments. Spending by domestic travelers was $73 billion million per day in Virginia, which ranks eighth amongst all states in the District of Columbia. Um, every dollar spent on tourism generates $7 in tax revenue uh, for the Commonwealth. Research by uh, VTC, Virginia Tourism Corporation, um, shows that, uh, or estimates that a lost visitor spending uh, due to pandemic was between nine and $10.9 billion uh, in 2020, and will be between 3.8 and 7.8 billion in 2021. The same research estimates that 56 to 68,000 travel and tourism jobs uh, will be lost in 2020 and maybe 24 to 50,000 uh, in 2021. Um, in lodging, it, you know, it, as I said before, it's been even more devastating. Uh, Pre-pandemic um, showed that uh, there were 46,478 jobs in January of 2020 in Virginia, and it got reduced to 23,665 jobs in 2021. Uh, this is all Bureau of Labor and Standards uh, data. Um, and, you know, the star data on, on revenue per available room, what the hotel here is called RevPAR, uh, Virginia lodging businesses have experienced a monthly average 50.5% decrease uh, compared to the prior year, totaling more than $2.2 billion in lost revenue. Um, rest, uh, room revenues uh, will recover, uh, but food and beverage revenue is really slow to recover uh, because people just aren't coming to hotels to eat uh, at this point. Uh, in restaurants in Virginia, uh, we've seen equally disturbing impact with the industry seeing significant contraction in employment from pre-COVID-19 levels of 304,000 jobs in, in Virginia alone to 194. Um, which basically shows more than a third of all jobs were lost uh, in Virginia in restaurants. So, uh, you know, now we also saw 77% of all restaurants uh, reporting lower sales in January 21 than they did in January 20. Now, um, you know, January 2021 was like a million years ago in, in my world, in my business, because now it's May. And guess what? Our sales are back up. Um, and we're ecstatic. Um, we're jumping up and down. That <laughs> This is the moment we waited for. When can we reopen? Um, if I wasn't asked that question once, I was asked it a million times uh, during the pandemic from all over the state, from all of our members in, in the Virginia Restaurant Lodging and Travel Association. That was the $64,000 question. When will the restrictions go away? When can people sit at my bars? When can I use every table instead of every other table? Um, when can we take off our masks? So. Thank God and, and thank science, um, you know, that we're, we're there now. And uh, as of last Friday, um, we were able to fully reopen um, and that's a blessing. Uh, however, uh, the big issue now and, and really the subject of today is, is um, we are really can't staff. And uh, I see someone put a question in how, how staffing. So we're, we're really, um, that's really the subject. So how are we going to staff? Why, why can't we staff um, is, is, the big, uh, is the big question. You know, uh, again, the restaurants are recovering quicker than hotels. I see Mark Carrier on the call. Mark is, is my hotel expert. Uh, he's on the board with us and visit Fairfax and, and um, VRLTA as well. So I, we share a lot of information. Um, and hotels can't get employees any easier than restaurants can. The $64,000 question is why. Um, 
I don't have all the answers, but I have a lot of feedback. I have a lot of people talking in my ear about what the problem is. Obviously, we've had to reinvent ourselves. Obviously, uh, the business isn't what it used to be. Uh, you know, we've had to take people um, that used to be a server and make them a to-go person. Well, they don't necessarily want it to go per be a to-go person. They want to wait tables. Um, but that's the job we have for them right now or during the pandemic. So the job has changed. Also, it became very, very restricted. A lot of rules that they never had to deal with before. You know, the customers could take off their mask, but heaven forbid an employee should take off their mask. They get chastised and, you know, the customers calling the Board of Health and saying this employee didn't do this. And, you know, it just became so restrictive that people just threw up their hands and said, I don't want to deal with this. You know, maybe I'll come back when this is all over. Um, but more importantly, you know, this COVID fear, um, people... A lot of us um, on this call, I'm assuming most of us on this call, I don't know all of you, I know a lot of you, um, want to, uh, we're able to work from home, you know, in, in, the, in the sanctity of your own home office or kitchen or wherever, where you're nice and safe. And restaurant employees and hotel employees still had to go to work, physically go to work and, and work, um, you know, in the field and uh, wash their hands 400 times a day and wear gloves and wear masks and uh, very, very uh, strong precautions put on. So, and so it became the, the job became much more difficult. Uh, additionally, uh, we all know about the unemployment incentives. Uh, that is something that, you know, has a lot of discussion going around this country. Um, I, I'm a firm believer in unemployment. Um, I think that's necessary at times in everybody's life. Um, the incentive that was put in by the federal government at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I got that, I understood it. I don't understand it now, candidly. I, I think it's a disincentive. Um, I mean, if I think the uh, the basic unemployment in Virginia is three hundred seventy eight dollars, plus you add another three hundred dollars current incentive to that, that's six hundred seventy eight dollars. That's thirty five thousand dollars a year to sit home, and with with no, you know. By the way, we all know that you're supposed to uh, apply for two jobs a week. Um, that requirement was lifted during the pandemic, during the crisis, during the emergency. I think someone told me it's going back into effect today, June 1st. Um, so I hope that's the case. And, you know, people will have to uh, start thinking about getting back to work. You know, there are states out there right now, Denver, I know did it, New Hampshire did it, where they're actually flipping that. And they, uh, they have flipped it and they, they're calling them back to work incentives. Uh, I think Denver, I read, uh, was somewhere between $1,600 and $2,000 um, as a stimulus for pe to get people back to work. So my opinion would be if we could do that, it's not just my opinion, it's the feedback I'm getting from all my constituents. Um, you know, let's flip the unemployment and try to get them, give them back to work incentives. Of course, all companies out there have already uh, been out there offering incentives. You know, we're, off, we're offering $300 uh, for if somebody brings us a new employee, um, we're also um, offering them another $300 if that employee stays for 60 days, um, hire, on the spot hiring bonuses. Um, you know, we're doing everything we can to hire. Why, why are we so shorthanded? It's because we lost so many employees during the pandemic. Uh, and now we're trying to, everybody's fighting to get those same employees back. And it's, it's a very um, arduous situation because, um, you know, this is physical work. They're working on their feet. They're working with the public. And I believe, by the way, I, I'm an optimist. You don't, a lot of you don't know me yet. I believe we'll be we will be back to normal, whatever normal was. Uh, the guests want normal. You know, if, if any of you um, have eaten out recently, you know that restaurants are starting to get busy. You know that businesses are starting to come back, and you and you, there's a lot of dose of patience there because you see they're understaffed. They're seeing uh, you're seeing that. Um, you know, in my case, uh, I, I used to have 14 servers on the floor at the Burke Glory days on a Saturday night and this past Saturday night I had eight. Um, so they either get take double the amount of tables or we keep some tables closed. I never thought that I'd be sitting here in front of you after you finally gave you, after the government finally gave me permission to open where I would still voluntarily keep tables closed. Um, why? Because that's just common, that's just good business sense. You know, we're, we, we can't uh, service the guests. We don't, we don't want people sitting there. So it's really been, um, um, you know, a lesson in creativity. Uh, a recent VRLTA survey shows 
83% of all restaurants and hotels in Virginia are now hiring and 84% uh, of them are at least somewhere between 30 and 40% staffed lower than they were at this time last year uh, or in 19, sorry. Um, so it's, it's really um, a crisis uh, and everybody's asking, what can they do to help? Um, our, our thinking is that, uh, you know, our, our, business, our business model economically um, has really, really suffered. Uh, we have had phenomenal success uh, because of the PPP program. I don't think there's anyone in my industry that's not um, graciously thankful for the PPP program that helped us be here today. Uh, I don't think we would have made it without that. Although I do think we're, we're, we're all scratching our head as to why Virginia was one of the only states in the union that um, actually decided to tax a big portion of PPP program. Um, we didn't. We thought that was going to be a, a, a grant, um, a forgivable uh, loan. We still haven't gotten forgiveness. Many of us, uh, I, actually, I don't know anybody that's gotten full forgiveness for the PPP program because of the slow, uh, the slow turn of the red tape. Um, we're all hoping they'll be forgivable. Otherwise, it converts to a loan. So we all kind of are cautiously optimistic, if you will, um, that that will be a, a forgivable loan and that we won't have to pay it back. Um, but then, you know, there were grants and, and Supervisor Faust, it was very refreshing uh, to hear you speak a few minutes ago that you already get it uh, and all the folks on your economic council get it in terms of the crisis that the industry is in um, and uh, the grants, you know, that you've worked on in the past. I just want to comment one minute on the grants. Um, and I mean no disrespect in any way, shape or form to independent operators uh, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, they always go to the front of the list, and they should. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, the problem with a lot of the grants is by the time you get to someone that's not a minority-owned business, there's no more money. And it keeps running out. And by the way, there's there's a lot of randomness to uh, Mark and Barry. I see them both on my screen here. Um, you know, we've had this conversation a hundred times. There's a lot of randomness to how grants get um, deployed. And the definition, if you will, of what's a small business, what's a mid-sized business. And I'm, I can only speak from experience. So let me just give you one example of what I'm talking about. Um, everybody's got a different definition of what big business is and what small business is. But uh, a lot of models were, if you have more than 50 employees, you're automatically um, exempt from any grants. If you have more than X amount in sales, in a lot of cases, if you do more than a million dollars in sales, you're exempt. Um, and then, you know, the most recent um, egregious uh, example of this is uh, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund that you've all been hearing about on the news for so many months now, uh, the $28.6 billion just targeted to help restaurants. Um, the exclusion was if you have more than 20 restaurants, you're out. You, you don't qualify. Well, guess what? Uh, Glory Days happens to have 21. So the reality is, uh, you know, we, we haven't gotten a penny. We did get two grants from in Northern Virginia from Fairfax, I believe. Two of my restaurants have less than 50 employees. And I think we got a, I think we got a check. So thank you for that. But um, with VRLTA uh, and the work we've been doing there, um, we've come up with a program that we think is more fair. Um, you know, to your point, uh, Supervisor Fast, about the American Rescue Plan, you know, th that money is um, is huge. Um, you know, that was signed by President Biden on March 11th. $350 billion is going to the states. And we have 25% um, of that is earmarked for the hospitality business. So we know that's coming. So what we've done at Virginia Restaurant and Lodging and Travel is we have gone um, pretty much on a roadshow um, with everyone starting with um, uh, Aubrey Lane, you know, at, at, at uh, the head financial guy in Virginia, and we've worked our way down to every state senator and, and delegate that's on the financial committee, and we've told them our proposal. Our proposal should be that there should be no entry level restrictions. It shouldn't be based on, for disperse, disbursement of grants, it shouldn't be based on how many employees you have or what size company you work for. You know, there's a lot of misnomers out there. A lot of people think because you're a Marriott Fairfield Inn hotel that you're a billionaire. 
Well, these are all independent operators with independent uh, businesses, and they um, depend on, you know, they're not part of the Marriott chain. They don't have deep pockets. So the reality is we came up with a formula and we didn't make it up, by the way. We, we got it from some of our neighboring states like Maryland and North Carolina and D.C., um, where every hotel room in the state of Virginia would get $1,500. It didn't, doesn't matter what your sales are. It doesn't matter how many employees you have. And every full service restaurant would get uh, $150 per seat. Um, and we feel like that's a fairer way to disperse funds than having random um, assignments over, you know, who's a big company, who's a small company. Of course, uh, minority owned companies and uh, underprivileged companies would still get first dibs on, on anything like that. Um, but the reality is a lot of companies like Mark Carriers, which is BF Sol, by the way, for those of you that don't know, and myself, you know, we're just average uh, operators. And we, we basically got no funding, except the PPP loan, um, which we're still on edge with whether it's going to be forgivable or not. So, um, you know, from our perspective, um, we can we can do our own um, training. We can we can we just need people to be incented to come back to work, and the pool of people that is out there to work in Northern Virginia, um, I, I do believe that, you know, our I'm not saying this to be arrogant. I think. I don't know how many of you have worked in a restaurant in your life. I think it's a great life experience. I can't tell you how many, um, I mean, all in, we, we have about 1,700 employees um, and we're, we're back to about 1,500 at this point, but I could probably hire at least 20 or 30 employees in every one of my restaurants tomorrow if they were knocking on my door. Um, I think mom and dad in a lot of cases are influencing for young people. They don't want their kids to go back to work in a scary, environment dealing with the public but slowly people are starting to come back kids are coming back from school mom and dad are saying it's time to get back out to work and i think that um it's you know again i said before i'm an optimist i think my guess is that by labor day uh, we'll be fully staffed again um but we need to we need the support now we need the uh bodies now uh to work to to, to this new level uh, I'm, I'm proud to tell you that our our sales in my company are uh, certainly back to pre-COVID levels, uh, and then some. Um, and the reality is um, we're doing it with less employees. So that's not, that's not a recipe for success. That's actually, it's not sustainable. Um, and you know, I know a lot of people in, our, uh, in the hotel business, um, our vice chair at VRLTA, uh, I won't share his name right now, but he's in Richmond running a group of hotels. He told me he had to resign because he's too busy cleaning rooms because that's how hard, they can't find anybody to clean rooms. They can't find janitors. They can't find maids. They can't find um, room service folks. So uh, this is what it's come to. And, and, and by the way, my managers are doing hourly positions as well because we're, that's who we are. That's the industry we're in. We, we do what it takes. Um, that's how I know we'll survive. But the reality is it's, it's been very, very hard to find people. And so, you know, what are we asking Anybody that's in government, um, we're, we're, I just want to say a few things and I'll wrap up. Um, you know, we are asking for an end to the unemployment um, uh, special incentives, uh, possibly to flip that to um, incentives to come back to work. Um, and Supervisor Fast, you already mentioned this, so I'm just going to touch on it. But yes, anything you can do to help keep our patios open, um, keep the permits um, not so difficult to get, to keep the patios open, the sidewalk dining that we're going to need that not only this summer this fall maybe next summer um and anything you can do to keep the burden off small business that uh you know we have minimum wage issues that i don't really want to get into on this call um i by the way uh, i will make one point because i think i don't think i could sleep at night if i don't make this point every day um there is a big push in this country to eliminate tip wage and for those of you that don't know what tip wage is um, in full service restaurants and hotels alike, um, we, we've been paying two thirteen an hour to tip servers. And sometimes people just hear that and they don't hear the rest of the sentence. Um, none of our people make two thirteen an hour. As a matter of fact, the highest compensated people in the restaurant business today are servers and bartenders um, because of tips. And it's just the American system. It's what we've been doing forever. Uh, our servers in my company 
And my, my data shows throughout the state uh, make between 17 and $23 an hour. Um, that's plus the 213. Um, so they're really making closer to 23 to $25 an hour. And they don't want tips to go away. But there is a push in this country and in the state. Uh, and we've been educating people a lot on um, the, the impact that the elimination of tip wage would have on our business. Right now, it would be completely catastrophic and devastating. So we're looking to um, try to dispel that uh, and educate people as to the importance of keeping the tip, tipping system alive. Um, so, you know, so we would ask your support on that. Anything that impacts the restaurants uh, that can be put off, um, you know, the little things. Um, look, I, I'm an environmentally friendly guy, um, but now all of a sudden there's a styrofoam ban. Um, why is that important? Well, guess what? 35% uh, of my sales are to go. Uh, and it used to be, you know, like 8%. So now the to-go sales have gone up. Um, the use of to-go packaging has gone up and the cost of to-go packaging has gone up. Um, I did a quick uh, num number crunch this morning and um, the impact of um, elimination of styrofoam is about 38 to $40,000 per restaurant per year. That's what it would cost, cost us. So of course, everybody says the same thing. Well, just raise your prices. Um, I've heard that a lot. Um, and there is a limit to how much people want to pay for a burger. I've already raised my prices because my cost of goods have gone up. I've already raised my prices because cost of labor has gone up. Uh, and by the way, every commodity has gone up as well. You know, oil and deliveries and, every, and utilities and rents and uh, everything's gone up. So um, there, there is a breaking point for how much people want to pay for a burger. So, you know, with, with that said, um, anything that, that's coming down the pike in the future, um, you always hear us balking about things like meals taxes and TOT taxes. These are things that are that really affect our industry. Um, and I'm not saying they can never happen, but this would be catastrophic if anything like that happened uh, at a time like this. So I think I'll stop talking and maybe answer some of your questions or try to answer some of your questions. Really, uh, thank you so much. Appreciate your perspective and uh, you know, your... Uh, Perseverance, I guess, is uh, getting through this past year has had to have been just brutal. And uh, you know, we congratulate you and the, the members of your industry who you know survived. I know we lost some really good players in your industry, and uh, it's uh, you know, in a sense never going to be the same uh, because of that. But uh, some really good players like yourself have. Uh, made it through and hopefully you see nothing but success in the future. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I would like to uh, open it up uh, and see if anybody had any questions for uh, Gary or uh, And we have a couple of folks. Presentation. Sorry, we have a couple of people uh, who have their hand raised. Should I go ahead and call on them, Supervisor Fast? That'd be awesome. Thank you. Okay, so Corey, I see you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Mr. Cohen, I really appreciated your presentation. Uh, I'm the chairman from the Northern Virginia Black Chamber of Commerce. I'm subbing in for Sheila Dixon, who cannot be on the call today. Um, so uh, I'm also in the restaurant business and I have a franchise of uh, restaurants um, throughout Richmond uh, and up to Fredericksburg. And um, I agree with the far majority of everything that you've said. Um, I do have one question. Um, for those jurisdictions that have flipped the, uh, I guess the unemployment incentive, that extra $300 and use that as an incentive to get people back to work, how long do you think it will be before we have data to determine whether or not that was effective? Uh, Cause I think that would be important if we want to pursue something like that in Virginia or elsewhere, it would be great if we had data to know if that was an effective strategy. Yeah, I, that's a great question. I, I wish I had the answer. I might get my best guess. Those will put it in immediately in New Hampshire and Denver. Um, just, you know, it, it was the equivalent of getting a stimulus check. So I, I would think that we will see quick results because it was quickly implemented. It wasn't something that was dragged out over a long time. Maybe by Labor Day would be my guess. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, and TJ, I see you have your hand up. TJ, are you there? 
Yeah, sorry, I just had some trouble unmuting my audio. Uh, appreciate it. Um, thank you. I, I, I'm a fan of Glory Days. I live in uh, Northwestern, and I can walk to a Glory Days, which is wonderful. Um, my, my question has to do with, during the pandemic, rates of poverty actually decreased. What does this say about what we're paying food service workers today, um, I guess would be a question. Am I not paying enough for my burger and my beer? And I think also your comment about eliminating tip wages, why would this be devastating if that rule was applied across all restaurants? Thank you. Well, let me take the second one first because that's an easy one for me. The, um, the business model, the way the full service restaurant industry was uh, developed, casual dining, uh, where you know, really in the 70s, uh, early 70s, casual dining became uh, such a big part of society we live in today. Um, you know, when I was a kid growing up, you had to go downtown to go to a, a fancy restaurant. But, uh, you know, with, with the spread of full service restaurants uh, in the 70s with the Fern Bars and uh, having all these chains come out to suburbia, the whole business model was designed with the tipping model in, in mind. So um, the fact that the customers paid basically for the service. So a typical full service restaurant 70% of all employees in my restaurants are tipped employees. They're servers, they're uh, bartenders, they're busboys, they're and the like to go people. So those people right now we're paying 213 an hour to, uh, if we have to all of a sudden, if tip wage is eliminated, then we have to pay them $15 an hour. Let's say if that maybe it's 11, maybe it's 15. So the, the math on that uh, is our business model just doesn't work. You know, a, a typical restaurant like mine only makes about $250,000 in profit. Um, but that number, if, if you do the math on that, that uh, differential, that delta is $13 an hour uh, times 50,000 hours that we spend on, on uh, servers and, and bartenders uh, is like $650,000 um, cost to us in a restaurant that makes $250,000 profit. So the economics just don't work. So you say, well, raise the prices to compensate. Well, there's two things wrong with that. One is, uh, I don't believe Americans will ever stop tipping. I think they're going to get tipped anyway. So these servers that are making $23 to $25 an hour will now get uh, $15 an hour plus the tips. So, you know, they're going to be making maybe $60 an hour or something like that. And they're not, they're not asking for the tip model to change. They like it just the way it is. They can go in, they can work four or five hours and they can make, you know, hundred or two hundred dollars in tips and go home and they don't want it to change and our economics don't work if it changes so you, you'll see restaurants close by the way I'll just I'm sorry to ramble but um, if you want to see what the impact of eliminating tips or raising tip wage will have just go to California because it's already there I have two sons that live in California I go there all the time full service restaurants are now not full service you go into them um, the hostess will seat you they'll give you a menu and they'll tell you when you're ready to order, go see the bartender and tell him what you want. And he'll call you when the food's ready and you'll pick it up. Um, so the, the, the model just changes. And that's not what people want. People want to be waited on. Um, that's already happening out there. Why? Because they can't afford the servers. So anyway, I don't know if I answered your question. I forgot what part one was. Uh, part one had to do with during the pandemic, rates of poverty dropped across the country, probably because of the $300 spiff and the unemployment benefits. What does that say about what we're paying people? Yeah, I, I, you know, that's, I guess that's subject to interpretation. I, I think, um, I, I think people in our, in our business are not complaining about their wages. I think people in our, in our industry are, are happy with their wages. And there's a huge opportunity for them to climb up the corporate ladder and become a hotel general manager or, you know, a restaurant manager if they're not happy with their wages. Um, so it, it I, I don't know. I think um, pandemic made everybody stay home. I think a lot of disposable income was uh, increased. Uh, I think that people uh, were indulging on carry out and, and whatnot, but I think, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure they're directly related. I think the poverty level in uh, Fairfax County does exist by, by all stretch, but we have plenty of jobs for people. So it's not, I, I think there are a lot of people that aren't working right now or just send them my way, I'll, I'll hire them. Thanks, Gary. Um, so there's a, a lot of really uh, great comments in the chat. So thanks, everyone. I think we might have time for, for maybe one more question or, or comment. 
Um, we just need to make sure we get on to our next presentation. But Barry, I see you have your hand up. Oh, well, thank you very much, Rebecca and Gary. Thank you. I think you painted the story of where we're at really well. There are two points that I would like to mention. Now, Gary has said a lot of his business has actually come back to pre-COVID levels. However, I really want to underscore sales does not translate to profit. During the pandemic, many of our restaurant tours and our hoteliers deferred many, many payments. And as a result of the deferral, that money eventually has to be paid back. So right now, our restaurant tours and our hoteliers may be back to pre-COVID, but they're paying expenses based on the time where they had no revenue. So I think it's very important to remember, even though sales are back up, we are not making profit. The other point I wanted to make relates to hotels. You will hear a lot, certainly in the media, that hotels are now back to pre-COVID. That is not true across the country, certainly not here in Northern Virginia. Right now, Charlottesville, Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach, they're all at about 70 to 80 percent occupancy because they don't rely on business travel. They really rely on leisure. Here in Northern Virginia, our hotel occupancy remains at 40% or lower. For a hotel, you need to be at at least 50% occupancy before you're making profit. So the hotels have not earned a penny for about 14, 15 months. And they are currently still losing money here in Northern Virginia. Now I tell you that because related to the topic of bringing back employees. Right now, if a hotel here in Northern Virginia got up to about 70% occupancy and they had more demand than that 70%, they couldn't handle it. So even as the business goes up and the hotels have an opportunity to earn money, they're really restricted by the fact they have nobody in the hotel to service it. So the only reason I bring all of that up is right now, more than even during the pandemic, it is critical, critical that the hotel, the restaurant, and the tourism industry as a whole continue to get provided to them any opportunity just to keep them open and in business. And with that, Rebecca, I hate to end it on somewhat of a downer note, but that is reality and what we're facing right now. So Rebecca, thank you, Supervisor Faust. Thank you and Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, you, you didn't really sign on for this, I know, when you came here several years ago. Uh, none of us did, but uh, nobody got hit harder 
than you and your industries that you uh, support. And boy, are they lucky they had you. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be very, uh, very good going forward. Uh, you're, you are where you are, and we're glad you are. Uh, I just want to do, uh, take a little bit of bragging rights on behalf of my the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we, we, were, uh, we made sure our uh, grant program did not have winners and losers. I know some grant programs do, but uh, the way the, the board did it, uh, we kept raising the amount of money uh, that we put into that uh, grant program uh, until we got to the point where every single qualified applicant uh, received a grant. Uh, and that, what, that did include a very high percentage of uh, minority women and uh, veteran owned businesses, which we were very pleased about, but everyone uh, got a grant. And if only every grant program could be like that instead of uh, the winners and losers that were referred to, you know, it's just, uh, we're fortunate we were able to have, we had resources we could do that. Uh, the next presentation is, gonna, is by, first of all, by two of the uh, most thoughtful uh, uh, people who th think deepest, I would uh, argue, about uh, the northern, the regional economy and, uh, you know, uh, who understand where we are and uh, where we can go uh, if we implement the right uh, policies and do the right things. Uh, and they're going to talk to us about some of those uh, policies today in, in terms of uh, uh, training and redirecting uh, uh, people into uh, technology industries. And that would obviously uh, would probably uh, uh, people from uh, all the industries that were hit the hardest during COVID. So first we have uh, Terry Clower, doctor. Uh, North Virginia Chair and Professor of Public Policy at George Mason University. He's also Director of GMU's Center for Regional Analysis. Dr. Clower has authored or co-authored over 150 articles, book chapters, and research reports reflecting experience in economic and community development, economic and fiscal impact analysis, transportation, land use planning, housing, and economic forecasting. And I could go on, but I, I won't because I want to introduce you to someone you probably already know, and that's Jonathan Averman, uh, who is uh, has worn many hats, but uh, currently uh, is the dean of the School of Business and Technology at Marymount University. Jonathan is a uh, highly respected thought leader on entrepreneurship and innovation. His experience as a venture investor innovation consultant, university professor, and media commentator gives him a, a 360 degree perspective on entrepreneurship and technology innovation. And uh, we're very, very fortunate to have these uh, two gentlemen join us today. Uh, they are uh, going to make a presentation on a program I believe that has been uh, adopted by uh, Go Virginia Region 7. Uh, project. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, the floor is yours. So, thank you very much, um, Supervisor Faust. Uh, always a, a pleasure. And of course, I get to, to join this group on a regular basis. So, what we're going to do, uh, and we're going to move quickly because we want to leave time for discussion and questions. Uh, uh, Jonathan is going to present some initial findings that we've had in a project that was funded by the Region 7 Council looking at issues regarding the reskilling of workers into technology positions. And we found some interesting things and I'll let him do that. And then I'll, when uh, Jonathan finishes, I'll conclude with a couple of remarks. So Jonathan, go ahead and take it away. All right, pal, you're driving the slides. So that's a good thing. Good to see you all today. So the context here, Terry's going to the next slide, is, is that uh, Terry and I have been very interested, uh, as you all know, because <laughs> we've come to spoken with you before and really trying to understand the topography of uh, our innovation economy. And uh, this particular project is, uh, is around workforce. And uh, more to the point, you know, not trying to dictate where people should go to work, uh, but just from the standpoint of how do you get people if they want to get into an industry, how do you get them into it? And we looked specifically at the tech industry and we used the, uh, the idea of uh, having 
displaced leisure hospitality and retail workers during COVID as, as a way to get at understanding the tech workforce. Because if you could take people that had really interesting customer focused skills and soft skills, uh, what would it take for those people to get uh, into technology employment if they chose to? And so by looking at that, we were able to gain some really interesting insights in how companies look at non-traditional candidates. So the way we did this is we, we tried to architect a roadmap to help uh, policymakers and all of us figure out where to make investments and how to make them. And we determined, yeah, you go next slide, Terry, that basically we, we have in effect two distinct roadmaps that exist in our region. There's, and I'll go on and build off that, but they're two distinct roadmaps. One roadmap is people that have traditional backgrounds, meaning not traditional from the standpoint of a particular gender or a socioeconomic background, but just traditional from the standpoint of having a degree-based credentialization. They've gone to an educational institution that's, that, that basically has provided in effect a good housekeeping seal of approval that these people have a, a, accomplished a certain level of skill by accomplishing a degree. The more interesting and more complex side of things is the non-traditional candidate. You know, somebody who has been credentialized or otherwise is able to demonstrate skill attainment through different processes. For example, somebody who's been a great uh, restaurant manager. There are a lot of and a growing number of training programs and different alternative mechanisms for people to get uh, credentialized in a non traditional way. Boot camps, different training programs, been a lot of training programs funded by Go Virginia, uh, the state and the counties over the years uh, that are all uh, around skills based development. Next slide, Terry. So you've got this, you know, if you start to look at it from a standpoint of you've got two, two distinct uh, uh, pathways, you then have to ask yourself the question, well, do you have one employment market? And the reality is, is that we have at least three uh, employment markets in the tech industry. We have government contracting around technology. We have uh, privately and publicly held companies that focus primarily on technology. And then we have companies that use technology as a way to do business. And what we learned as we went off and talked with the CEOs and talent managers of these different types of companies, large and small, is that they approach traditional and non-traditional candidates in their own distinct way. So there's at least three different ecosystems where you have traditional and non-traditional candidates going in to try to find employment. And then interestingly enough, there is a fourth ecosystem that exists that's largely uh, been funded by government, but is now being funded by corporate philanthropy, which is around how to get people from unserviced communities or underserved communities into the tech industry. So basically you have not one ecosystem, you have four that exist code at the same time, which makes things complicated, but by the same token, you can start to conceptualize it by looking at this roadmap that I, I just provided. And you can pretty much locate every one of the training programs we have in the region and every one of the gaps we have in the region against this, this particular graph I just put in front of you. And I hope you'll take a look at that later. You can see, for example, that somebody who wants to go into the tech industry through a traditional pathway, whether they're unemployed, college incomplete, a high school graduate, they can go through the green arrows and find their way into one of these employers. The green arrow, by the way, between the two large employment sectors is a very important one, which is frankly one of the big problems right now in the tech industry, which is a lot of the employment that's going on is for experienced people where industry basically is poaching from each other or in the word of more than one person we spoke to actually rearranging the deck chairs on, on a sinking ship. Go to the next slide, Terry. So the way we did this, pro the way we did this project, uh, Terry's been looking at data. My part was very much to go off and talk with uh, uh, people. And then we spoke with uh, uh, well north of 40 individuals involved in, probably close to 50, involved in technology uh, in some way. We spoke to CEOs of some of the uh, uh, largest privately held technology product companies in the region. We spoke with uh, a former CEO of the largest government contract in the region. We spoke with uh, a good number of CEOs up and down the chain. And we spoke with uh, talent managers hiring people throughout the, uh, the ecosystem as well. And like I said, we basically identified that there are in fact not one technology industry, there are at least two, government technology, private commercial technology. Um, but there are more importantly, very, very discrete requirements. So for example, you know, government contracting, because of the national security requirements, they have a very strong bias and need for people who have degrees, are US citizens, have a clearable background. And that's just, just as kind of the way it is. So if you start to talk about programs to get people into tech employment, 
you really have to ask yourself the question, what kind of employment are you trying to get them into? Uh, whereas, you know, for private companies, say the uh, uh, Clara Bridges or the Canvases or the C events in our community, they're growing very rapidly. Um, these kind of traditional metrics are less important to them, perhaps, uh, because ultimately they don't have the national security limitations. Next slide, Terry. So based on all that, we we reached a number of preliminary conclusions. Uh, the first one is, and it was very interesting. So under the cover, when we were doing this project, as an aside, Terry and I were also talking about working with a specific nationally recognized trainer, uh, a provider of, of technology training. So we had the experience of going off this marketplace at a time when we were thinking about helping a large provider come into the market space while we were also doing this research. And one of the things that really struck me in particular was when I would talk with hiring people or CEOs about any specific training program, the response was universally. I mean, not once universally that we don't tend to hire out of any single training program. And I thought that was a very interesting insight. And it's something that got my attention as somebody to help the policymakers. What I was told was that they're looking for people who have a totality of interest demonstrable interest in making a career change or demonstrable interest in the industry. So for example, uh, somebody who's interested in hiring, say a, a software developer would say to me, you know, some of these boot camps are terrific, but I would never just hire out of a boot camp. I would want somebody who did a boot camp, did another boot camp, uh, maybe blogged about technology on the weekends, or somebody showed interest. Or somebody who's interested in the cybersecurity entry level position would have more than one cert certifications. So this idea that, that training is in itself, any one training program is sufficient to get somebody into a tech job is something we really need to take a long look at because it's not what I heard uh, from the employers. Um, I also heard very clearly that um, the commercial companies in particular are much more open to hiring non-traditional candidates than the government contract industry. Now, interesting caveat, a number of the HR folks at government contractors, larger ones, acknowledge that they do in fact either support or have programs to get non-traditional minority candidates into the industry. And the response to that was, yes, we do that. There are other reasons why we do that other than just straight up employment. And these programs are really important to us, but understand they're, they're programs for a specific purpose. You can't necessarily normalize those and assume that they would work across the entire workforce. And I thought that was a very interesting, that was one of the advantages of a confidential conversation, You know, get that kind of insight. So what we came away with was a conclusion that if we wanted to get people into uh, technology who aren't in technology, uh, we basically had an impedance mismatch. You know, for example, somebody who was an excellent project uh, manager wouldn't see themselves that way if they were a great restaurant manager. And they often would provide a resume to a technology company that says, I ran a really complex restaurant. And the HR manager would say, that's great, but that's not the language of my position. I need somebody who understands project management. Now, we were talking a little while ago about restaurants. You know, if you're good at managing your restaurant, you're probably going to be really good at project management. So part of this is, is to help the employers and the employees speak the same language, almost an impedance matching. Um, another thing we heard very clearly was that the employers, whether they're traditional or non-traditional candidates, want people that actually understand how to work in the tech industry. And I say, well, what do you mean by that? And really what they mean is understand things like LinkedIn, Salesforce, Slack, all the things that those of us that work in the tech industry take for granted. If you're not part of the tech industry, you don't necessarily know. The other side of it is, uh, and, uh, and this is interesting, I had a conversation just the other day with the CEO of a rapidly growing tech company in town. And he said to me, he was really struck recently because he was asked by a friend of his to mentor and help a, a young uh, black man who had graduated from a really good college find his way in the tech industry. And, and the, the lack of, of visibility into what a tech job could be was this candidate's biggest problem. It wasn't that he didn't have the interest. He literally didn't know how to map what he'd learned to uh, a sales function or a customer support function, customer support. So the CEO buddy of mine came away and reminded me that a lot of this may be that we need to do a better job of telling stories, you know, providing mentors, role models, not just for underserved, but for all young people and older people to get them into the industry. Next slide, Terry. Is this the last slide, Terry? Yes. 
Okay, so basically where, where we're at with the research is um, we recommend, we recommended the Go Virginia board that as they look forward to uh, uh, where to place their bets and how to uh, grow the tech ecosystem, the workforce, that they focus more on specific places of weakness, specific opportunities within this roadmap or these complex roadmaps rather than just doing proposals that boil the ocean because we, we came away with the clear impression that what we have here is more a need for tactical focus rather than necessarily more programs per se. So Terry, that's what I got. Well, thanks, Jonathan. And just to, to finish up on a couple of things uh, of kind of what's next, this particular uh, funding is one that is meant to help guide proposals that would be uh, evaluated for grant funding from Go Virginia at some later point in time. And we think it's important that we make a distinction here that there are a lot of training programs out there. Go Virginia continues to find innovative ones and things that fill particular niches. As Jonathan suggested, it's not any one of those is going to be the magic button or the one that just says, oh, this is, you know, it has to be a part of what gets added on in total. Having said that, what we are increasingly convinced of, and is the data still showing, as many of you are very much aware of, that our, our talent pool needs to grow, needs to grow faster than it's growing now. And there are a lot of workers out there that might be well suited to a technology career if they knew what it was about. So there's a communications, it's almost a little marketing in, in that sense in that it is communicating what is there and how do you translate yourself if you are interested. We are not suggesting somebody that has a great career in hoteling and, and restaurant businesses or anything like that. If that's what they wanna do, great. It's a, it's a fabulous career choice. But if, you're, if you feel that you could look at other career choices um, if you are not as interested anymore about continuing to be paid off of tips and the whims of, of uh, surly customers after, uh, after a long wait in line to get in a restaurant or something, that, you know, that we have a pathway and that we have a system and indeed a, almost a physical presence of an entity that can help do that translating between what the talent managers at our technology firms, both government and non-government, and that other sector that, that is mentioned in the slide of the ones that are not necessarily producers of technology, but users of technology, which indeed is increasingly the hospitality sector, how you get folks shifted in to that different area. So that's what we're, we're looking at so far. The data are still uh, are supportive of our findings that came up out of the uh, interviews that Jonathan did. Uh, and we will certainly be sharing more of this with uh, Supervisor Faust and the rest of the Region 7 Council as we proceed forward. And I know there are several members of the Council here, and we certainly appreciate the support uh, that we have had from Region 7 in doing this. But with that, let me stop and let's open it up for questions and discussion. Jonathan, you had your finger Yeah, up. I just want to add one thing, which is, uh, and this is very early on, but uh, Terry and I are now working on a, another project. And as part of that, <clears throat> over the last couple of weeks, I've gone off uh, to speak with a, a lot of tech uh, CEOs and venture and angel investors about the state of the uh, innovation ecosystem from the standpoint of growing new startups. And what's very interesting to me is that what I'm hearing very clearly right now is that the biggest issue they have now is hiring people. So we're hearing it you know, from the tech industry as well as from the restaurant industry. And I think that's very, very interesting to me um, that uh, there's a very strong belief that there's a lot of capital, a lot of resources available right now. And the one limiting factor for our tech industry, in fact, is talent. And I don't think I've ever heard that before. I mean, I've been doing this since 1998 and I've never ever heard a, a cross section of 30, 40 people telling me that the issue is not capital. It was always capital and all of a sudden it's talent. And I think that that's very revealing as you think about this from a standpoint of global, you know, overall policy, every industry is seeing the same problem right now, which is a lack of talent. That might be our biggest constraint as a region. So Terry, that's, yeah, if you guys have any questions, I, we were obviously here, last time we were here, we had a really good session. So we're looking forward to your thoughts. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, you, you, you do a great work. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to turn over to Rebecca to uh, 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 ask people uh, for uh, if they have questions uh, or comments. And 
Thank you. Yep, I am here. So I see a couple hands up. Um, one of the things that we did in advance is we wanted to make sure that we heard from our EAC, a few EAC members that also um, uh, are in industry and kind of in that place of looking to recruit uh, workers or retain workers. And so Kevin McNulty, if you're on the line, I didn't know if you had any kind of responses or, or, um, or comments or questions. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I think something that we've been focused on uh, for the past year is kind of twofold. One, it, it's making sure that students um, that are in elementary and high school are able to access the internet so they can set themselves up for a career in tech. And then also folks that um, maybe are trying to make that transition in their career that don't have access to the internet. We've been working um, with, with Fairfax County and other jurisdictions to partner to make sure that everyone has internet access. Uh, and I know that's been very successful. There's a lot of, a, a big piece of the ARPA money that's coming is um, related to broadband infrastructure. And that's something I know we'll be meeting with folks from Fairfax County to see how we can best get that money out into the community uh, so that people can set themselves up for that next career. Thanks, Kevin. So we have a couple hands up. So I'll go to Esther, um, and then uh, I think Janice is not able to raise her hand. So uh, Janice, after Esther, please go ahead. Hi, Rebecca, um, Jonathan, um, and Terry. Great job. That's really important information. Um, I, I also agree that I think interest in tech careers starts early. And so to the extent that Fairfax County Public Schools and others <clears throat> can do more to spark interest in, in um, tech careers, I think is, is helpful. Jonathan, when you did your interviews, did you, um, I don't know if you went into sort of, like, there's been a lot of apprenticeship programs in the region, um, as well as kind of more traditional internships. Um, have you, have you, did you get a sense of how well those things are working? Um, and then, you know, obviously, you know, companies, global companies like Capital One and, you know, uh, North of Grumman and others that we have in our backyard don't just higher from this area, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I remember when we were chasing Amazon HQ2, um, the CEOs would tell us that, you know, the great thing about this region is that we're able to att attract great tech talent from outside the region. So maybe Jonathan, you can talk a little bit about, so the balance between, let's make sure we get lots of our, our regional talent developed and ready for these jobs, but any thoughts on how hard it's been to attract talent from elsewhere as well? Boy, there are a lot of questions in there. So everybody just put on your pajamas. We'll be here for a while, but I'll, I'll try to get to them as quick as I can. So the, the first question you've asked, which is, is very interesting. Uh, the answer is that there are, we don't do apprentice. We really don't do many apprentice programs like, uh, you know, what happens in Germany or, or Europe, for example. And there's a very interesting open question right now as to whether or not the technology industry should have or is amenable to the classic apprenticeship approach. I think yes. But that's a very different conversation uh, and something that should be had. You asked about internships and uh, work training. The reality is, is that we have it and it's very episodic and it's not at all within any sort of coherent whole. Some large government contract industry uh, contractors, some large consulting businesses, some smaller tech companies have training programs and, and onboarding programs to get people in. Um, but they tend to be very company focused. They tend to be part of their hiring process. They tend not to be very, very uniformly promoted. What I see, you know, over the last two years is, you know, moving from being in the VC industry full time and doing innovation consulting to being a dean is I can see very clearly that the internship marketplace is highly fragmented for a lot of different reasons. Uh, personally, I think that for our region to really grow. I think, for example, like what the Northern Virginia Chamber is trying to do, you know, the more that we can create a broader ecosystem where, where internships are more broadly available, where there's some clarity around the difference between an internship, a summer job, and apprenticeship will be very helpful. Uh, so the short answer, Esther, is yes, these things exist. No, they don't exist in a coherent enough way for us as policymakers and leaders to really feel like we're taking advantage of the opportunity. The second question you asked me is around talent attraction and, and talent development generally without question. And this is one of the biggest things we need to be thinking about from an economic development standpoint is as we now see COVID has changed the nature of work, particularly for highly skilled people. They are unlikely to want to go back into an office full time. And there's going to be an expectation, certainly in some of the industries that are driving them, uh, that are driving the economy the fastest, people are going to want to live where they want to live and work where they want to work. 
This means that for a place like Northern Virginia, we really need to up our game on what we do from the standpoint of getting it to be a community where people want to live. Because here's the interesting thing, we may likely end up with people living in Northern Virginia that work for companies based in Austin and Bangalore. That's the nature of the world. So when you start to talk about talent attraction, you really have to think about the overall uh, desirability of the place to live. Uh, the last thing is uh, something that uh, Terry and I are starting to noodle over uh, and uh, is the idea of now that we've attracted Amazon, what does it actually mean for our tech industry? Because Amazon had a particular effect on Seattle and the type of companies that come in are very, very, they, they shape how spin outs happen. They shape how talent is created. And uh, we think that Amazon being here has clearly identified the regions of place people want to come to be tech employees. Now the question is, do we need more Amazons? Do we need more Hiltons? Do we need more government contracts? What do we need or startups to create that kind of environment? So I think Esther, I managed in less than five minutes to answer all your questions. So uh, I'm looking forward to that lunch you owe me. Okay. <laughs> the, and I just would add one thing to that though, in terms of that differential between internships and apprenticeships, we do internships fairly well. We, we remain oversubscribed in most of our technology internship programs. Apprenticeships is a completely different thing. And under our current state regulatory uh, processes, I am not an expert on it, but I am told that it is, let's say that we inhibit uh, innovation very well in this state when it comes to apprenticeships. And so there is a policy call here that we need to think about how we want to do that. And we're gonna to need to change some things in state regulations of how apprenticeships are managed, particularly when they're connected with our institutions of higher learning. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, wow, congratulations. That was a lot of, a, a, great, a big response in a short amount of time, so thank you. So um, we do have a lot of hands raised, but uh, let's go to Janice and then I want to, and then Steve, and then I want to make sure that we hear from um, Dana Kaufman from Nova and then Eileen. So Janice, please go ahead. Okay, just just quickly, um, I think I got the echo. Are you hearing an echo? Am I coming across clear or an echo? There is an echo. If everyone else could be you while Janice is speaking, please. Okay, let me just see. That's a little better. No, it's not. Dang it. Janice, do you have two devices set up right now? That could be what's causing the echo. Sorry, we actually can't hear you, Janice. This one's not having. So okay. Maybe um, if you'd like, also you can type your question in and we can make sure that um, I can read it out to um, Terry and Jonathan. If that's okay, possible. let's see, can you hear me now? That's working, yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we got you, thank you. Maybe you can't hear us. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go ahead and move over to Steve and chat Can with you. Can you give me a second and I'll get back to you. Oh, darn it. Okay. Steve, do you want to go ahead and ask your question, please, Mr. Potter? Yeah, well, actually, um, it's a quick comment. Um, this is something uh, related to what we're talking about and also related to the controversy over TJ. Uh, one of the things in terms of developing people. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you at least. Now I can't. Well, in any case, let, let me just quickly say um, one of the things uh, related uh, to yeah. training people is what we provide them at at the very youngest ages. And I think of the model of France, where at nine o'clock in the morning in every French school, in their equivalent of sixth grade, every child is getting the same education. They have the same opportunity. And in Fairfax County and in the United States in general, we don't have that. So that if you are in one of the schools in Fairfax, and I'm thinking particularly in terms of high school, uh, you may have some languages offered, other schools don't offer them. Um, the advanced math courses are not given at every school. So something to consider raising with the school board uh, that would feed into developing people to be make sure that every child 
in Fairfax County is given an opportunity to learn higher level math, to learn advanced languages, and so on. Because I would argue that our current system is discriminatory. And anyone who wants to comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you um, so much. So I just, I wanna see if we can pack in a, a couple of questions. So Jonathan- yeah, Rebecca? Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, can I, uh, before uh, you ask any more questions, I, uh, I should have announced at the beginning, but I couldn't see who was here, that uh, Supervisors Walkinshaw, Stork, and Elkhorn have been with us. Uh, I'm not sure if any other supervisors have been on the call, but I wanted to acknowledge their presence and ask if, uh, if there is anyone else, please let me know. This was supposed to be kind of a day off from meetings for the Board of Supervisors. Uh, and uh, we snuck this one in and uh, 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 other supervisors had made uh, plans that uh, preclude them from being here. But thank you to James and Dan and Walter uh, for your participation. Back to you. Okay, um, so let's just uh, move right along. So uh, I'll move to Mr. Potter, Steve Potter, and then Dana Kaufman, please. Uh, yes, I, my wife works for a, um, a large company that has a heavy focus on government uh -huh. technology uh -huh. and uh, on uh, government contracting. And she has been mentioning to me uh, for quite a while now that there's been a large influx of folks from uh, who are previously in the, in the restaurant business and such who have come over with basic skills, uh, getting heavily involved in help desks, um, and they've taken courses that prepare them to be able to fit into some of the positions that uh, she may be looking for. And the biggest draw for them it seems to be the steady hours, the higher wages. Uh, there are benefits that go along with it. They have paid vacations and stability. Um, so there are, it, it's an attractive alternative now that folks may not have looked at before. So I think when we when we say that perhaps there's not a lot of folks out there because they are um, getting paid extra money from the government, that may not be 100% um, accurate because there are folks out there who have basically been forced to look beyond their comfort zone um, and have found a, a territory that provides a lot of positives for them. Um, and it is a significant impact, at least um, in the arena that my wife works in. So I thought I would bring that up because as Jonathan was talking earlier, I kept saying, you're right on, because everything that he was saying uh, was exactly what I was hearing uh, from my wife. There is another area also that is um, drawing a lot of folks, and that is distribution. There are uh, folks who are working in distribution centers or getting involved in logistics and areas like that where they may not have done it before. But again, because their world has been disrupted, they have looked elsewhere and they have found a good place. So I just wanted to confirm John's, Jonathan's uh, initial feedback because for me, it was spot on and uh, thank you. So Steven, so I'll send you the, the $5, I promise you later. But uh, it was um, 10, Jonathan. Oh, okay, it's 10. Yeah. But actually, I'm glad you mentioned it because I didn't I didn't bring this out enough to the presentation. Um, the, the anecdote of government contractors hiring people with these backgrounds, just about everybody I talked with had at least one. You know, a, a, a wonderful waitress, a, a tremendous salesperson. You know, the CEOs in particular were very avuncular as they described this. Right. What I think is that there's an interest and appetite, but there's not to, you know, Esther's question about internships. We don't have a unified process. You know, we, we almost need, in, in a word, we almost need a finishing school. You know, we, we almost need some sort of pooled way to, to, to describe to people that aren't in tech what it would mean to have a job in tech, to say somebody who's working in a restaurant, you know, if you're able to deal with crazy people all day long and not punch somebody out, you probably could be a really successful customer support person for GovCon. And if you manage to get people to buy suits they don't need, you probably could be a great salesperson for tech company. And I think to, to Steve's point, and again, it's just a question where we want to place our bets, what we want to do as a society. But without question, the more we told these stories, look, by the same token, I see in the comments, you know, the comment about apprenticeship in, in construction, 
I think that a lot of there are a lot of opportunities for people to advance themselves if we gave them the opportunity to see what was in it for them. But anyway, I, I saw a lot of that in my research, Steve. Thanks for pointing that out. Thank you. So I think we'll try to just take a, a couple more questions. I know it's a little after 11, um, but it's such a great discussion. So if we could go for, uh, to- Can I try, can I try again? Okay, Janice, go ahead and then we'll okay. to Dana and then Eileen. Well, yeah, just, and thank you for uh, bearing with me and having that echo um, and um, being able to give me an opportunity just to share. It's not as much a question as sharing. And that's one thing back in the days when I was dealing with workforce development um, and the whole manufacturing area, they, I'm just wondering if it would be feasible because what we had done was based on co certain core comp competencies was to look at transferable skill sets across different platforms. So say somebody in a manufacturing environment came in contact with suppliers or people on a regular basis, um, they were able to look at that skill set and they, that person might be good in the hospitality industry. Um, and then in my survey with a lot of companies, um, what I got a lot of feedback was the soft skill that a lot of times we think a lot of students and young people or whatever, and people just do not know what the jobs are out there. And the employers sometimes do not know how, I'm sorry, to hire people. <laughs> With those with those skill sets that is transferable to their company, we want someone that's got a background that's done this. But we have a resource, a wealth of individuals out there that, if we we knew how to assess their skill sets, then you would be able to get that person at an early stage and groom them into your environment. The other thing that I wanted to share, I mean, we did a lot with that, with the Manufacturing Skills Standard Council, and I went around and dealing with a lot of that and, and looking at the soft skills. The other aspect that I found very powerful, um, and I concept I've always wanted to share many, many years ago, and I'll say many years ago because my husband was in a technology program for um, um, microcomputers. And when he graduated, nobody knew what, it, what they were. So it was a long time ago. They're like, what's a microcomputer, you know? So it was a matter of getting him started working in an environment. And the employment, unemployment, instead of, this was another country, instead of paying the person the unemployment to look for a job, they worked with the employer so that that person for six months worked on a job and the government paid that person's salary to give them that six month opportunity for training, hands-on training within the company. And so someone wasn't sitting home collecting unemployment, they were physically on the job in a company and they were paying the salary. So the company had an employee for six months that was recollecting employment, unemployment benefits, but to do the job and to have that training. So when he finished the six months, he was able to sustain the job. So there was just some two, two opportunities out there that I'm wondering if employers are at least taking a look at that or cons would consider those. So Janice, I just want to point out that uh, one of the things that I heard very clearly uh, as I talk with people is that uh, what you described is very much the world that we live in. People now hire based upon skills more and more rather than uh, degrees. Uh, they want to know what do you know how to do? And uh, one of the things that uh, we really need to do as a region is to help people who've obtained skills, whether it's the military and hospitality leisure, just however, whether it's a higher education institution or it's an employer, we need to figure out a better way to credentialize people other than the traditional pathways. Exactly. And uh, frankly, that's an area of, of very strong interest, a number of us on the call. And I think that's something we're gonna need to get after. Uh, uh, thank you, Jonathan uh, and Rebecca. Oh, I'm a little bit, uh, Am I coming through? Yeah. Yes. Well, we're concerned about uh, holding up our, uh, our speakers uh, any longer uh, over the uh, time we told them, because I know that they are in great demand in many different uh, areas. Uh, so perhaps uh, we can, uh, uh, if anybody has any more questions, please submit them to us. Uh, we'll be happy to respond to them. Uh, I would simply say, first of all, thank you to all our presenters. Thank you to uh, Rebecca for all she did to help pull the meeting together. And um, 
I want to remind everybody on the EAC that we only meet on occasionally, but every single day, every single member of my board, of our board, the Board of Supervisors, is focused like a laser on the, uh, the economy and economic development. It is, uh, and it, it's just a critical to everything we do. So please don't hesitate. We need your input. We need your assistance. The reason we've asked you to serve on the EAC is to advise us. Uh, it doesn't have to come to me. Uh, there's 10 of us on the board. Uh, once a good idea makes it to one of us, we'll make sure it gets to everybody. So please, uh, thank you for your participation today and always. Uh, and please, if you have thoughts, uh, and ideas, please share them with us. Uh, we will try to uh, convert them into action. Any final words from anybody? If not, I think we have to call it a day. And once again, thank you to our speakers. Everyone have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.